pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Carlo Mantegazza from the University of Naples. Uh, this is the first lecture he will talk about. He's an expert on the motion of partitions, so he will speak about the net motion of, of networks by mean curvature. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks to the ICTP and to Giovanni, Francesco, Carlo, and Claudio for the kind invitation. So as, I, as my title says, I'm going, to I'm going to discuss the motion of networks by curvature in the plane. And uh, actually, it's a long project that started 15 years ago, more or less, with uh, Matteo Novaga and Vincenzo Tortorelli when I was in Pisa. Then uh, well, we had a period that uh, simply we, didn't, we weren't able to find out new results. And we started with Annibale Magni, my ex PhD student, and Matteo Novaga again in 2010. And then, uh, more recently, with uh, Matteo Novaga and Alessandra Pluda, who is here, ex uh, PhD student of Matteo now in Regsburg, and uh, Felix Schulze, which is uh, one of the competitor groups, actually, that, uh, well, composed by Felix Schulze, Andre Neves, and Tom Ilmanen. And very recently, a couple of colleagues in Naples, Pietro Baldi and Manuele House, they started to get interested in uh, giving contribution to the subject, in particular, as I will discuss uh, next lecture, to the classification of cell similar solutions in network flow. So what is uh, all this project about? Well, you have something like this, a network, network curves in the plane. and. Uh, well, you want to let him evolve by mean curvature. What are the motivation? Well, not by mean curvature. Here there is only one curvature, by curvature. And uh, which means that you, you assume that at every point, at every, every point of this curve, at every time, it moves in normal direction by the curvature of the curve passing by there. Uh, what are the motivation? Well, actually, there is one easy physical, or actually, engineering motivation, which is some kind of a toy model, because it is one-dimensional and one-co-dimensional, for evolution, for the dynamics of an interface, in this case of a planar system. You can imagine that this region that contains immixable fluids, for instance, water, oil, fuel, stuff like that, they cannot. And these curves are simply the interfaces between the phases of your system. And in case the energy of your system, which is maybe not too realistic in this situation, but it's the easiest case, then you can try to generalize to more complicated ones. It's simply given by the total length, the sum of all the length of the interfaces around. So you have only this energy, you have your system, which is perturbed by the equilibrium, you let him evolve, and you want to understand what's going on. Actually, I have, I'm not cheating, I'm not, uh, engineer, I'm not a physicist, so I'm more interested in the mathematical side. This, the, the model part come from outside, so we only got the model of, uh, that, of this problem that came from several situations, like for instance also, I don't know, evolution of grime boundaries in uh, polycrystalline materials. So we concentrated more on the mathematical point of view, and actually, I me and Matteo at the beginning, we were also very interested in the fact that uh, after the, a lot of work of mean curvature flow in the smooth situation for hypersurfaces, mostly done by Gerard Wisken and uh, Richard, uh, Richard Hamilton, well, there was, uh, and the methods were actually differential geometry of curves and surfaces and uh, PDEs, in particular maximum principle. But at that point, there was a lot of work by analysts in order to generalize the motion by mean curvature to less uh, smooth sets. For instance, so at the end, uh, you have generalized definition of motion by mean curvature even for merely closed sets in the Euclidean space. For instance, level sets uh, formulation. But there are other generalization, for instance, with very false or other kind of generalization of, of uh, smooth surfaces, which are actually singular. So we were, we were a little bit interested in see how much you can push the um, 
standard classic parametric approach developed and mostly by, by Gerard Wiskin in particular, to a situation which is actually singular. These are not curves. Around triple junction here or multiple junction, here this network is only as triple junction. And there is a reason. But uh, in general, you can think of a network like a graph with multiple junction, with uh, four, five points, or whatever. And they are really singular sets. But actually, you can see, if you consider all the curves to be smooth, so the singularity is concentrated in a way in the multi, multi junctions. So you are in co dimension one, one dimension, and uh, <coughs> the energy of your system, in a way, since the motion by curvature is, in a way, the gradient flow of the energy associated to the sum of a total length around, or if you want, for a singular set to the H1 measure, the Hausdorff one dimensional measure of your set. So you want to, in a way, take the gradient flow by this energy. In a way, this is the simplest situation and the simplest uh, geometric object, singular, but not so singular. The simplest singular object. And so you have hope that if you, mostly of the techniques that you developed for the smooth case, could be even used also in this case. Actually, you have to deal with these guys to the triple junction. I think you can guess that if I use the techniques, standard techniques, in the interior of the curves, I can get results. Instead, here you have to develop something new. And actually, at some point, you have really to develop something new. And uh, differential geometry and maximum, maximum principle in particular is not really sufficient to deal with the problems given by the triple junction. So we you needed to use some extra variational method, which are, in a way, taken by the variational method that we use in the fully singular situation. So trying not, not to use in their full strength, but uh, just to deal with the, these very special singularities. So in a way, there are not so many singularities in the network curves, less than in the general case. OK, so before going on, there are some simulations of the motion of this guy. One that I'm going to show you is give, it was done by Ken Brake. And uh, as I said, I'm not a, a, a physicist, and not neither engineering, but uh, what I'm, I was told is that these simulations are very, very close to what you observe in uh, real experiments. Several of these, you can find a lot of information about this, for instance, on the website of uh, Kinderlehrer in the, um, at the Carnegie Mellon, that has a, a full lab which is uh, interested in studying real experiments, simulation, and theoretical conclusion on this kind of uh, motion of interfaces in general. So I'll show you this. This is a, a quite complicated network that evolves by this rule that I told you motion by curvature, you see that several things happen here. Regions are vanishing. New junction uh, are born after a region is, is vanishing. In particular, what you can observe is that apparently larger regions eat smaller regions. To be more precise, a region with more than six edges increase their area. Less than six edges decrease their area, actually. To one, maybe the, the easiest observation. Moreover, stop it for a while. Moreover, the exception of two peculiar phenomena, first, the easiest one, one region is disappearing, vanishing and disappearing at all. And there is another phenomenon that, without vanishing of a reason, that one single curve is vanishing. Like, uh, I'm betting, could happen to this curve here now. So the region is not disappearing, but simple one curve is disappearing. So the two regions bordering that curve lose one, uh, <coughs> lose, uh, one edge. And actually, after this, there is an opening to other two triple junction. And actually, if you look at the whole simulation, with the exception of these times where one region is uh, collapsing or one curve is disappearing, in all the other moments, you have only triple junction around. 
So four or more junctions, they don't live. They can appear only at a single time when there is some kind of change of structure because of these two possible phenomena. And uh, all the triple junction, if you look, have always the same free angles of 120 degrees between the free curves that are concurring at the triple junction. So you have these uh, special times when something happens, when you can see four points, five points, whatever, and a region has collapsed or a curve has disappeared. And in all the other times, you only have triple junction with 120 degrees. Now, I hope that is going to happen what I was saying, that this curve is disappearing. Here it is. There was no collapse of region. One curve disappearing and an opening in the other direction with other two triple junction going more or less orthogonally in the other direction. And let's see the conclusion. And then it stops. Okay, this simulation was in a way periodic can think it was you were in a torus. So it was the, the borders, maybe it's not so easy to see it, but the borders are the same, so there are no boundary points. Actually, what I want to discuss in my lectures a situation like this, I want to discuss the motion of a network inside always some domain which will be a convex set. This is only technical, but it's useful. Where I assume, for instance, <coughs> this guy a very simple network that we call it triod, actually. Where the points on the boundary of the convex set are fixed. and the network moves inside. This is kind of Dirichlet kind of problem. You can also change your problem and instead of asking that the, these endpoints are fixed, that uh, the networks arrive on the boundary, for instance, with a, uh, with a right angle, actually. Kind of Neumann boundary problem. Or, or that I'm going to see also for, if you have what we call open networks. Networks like, they don't have, the, the, the open set where we are discussing, it's the wall R2, and we have some lines, asymptotic lines, where the network is asymptotic at infinity, becoming straight and straight, asymptotically, to infinity, close to these straight lines at infinity, and inside your network does whatever, things like this. So all I want to discuss will apply also to this situation, not only to this, but also to more complicated situations. This, uh, yes. With fixed endpoints and uh, open networks where you assume that uh, the network is, are asymptotic to some fixed uh, half lines at infinity. And uh, for simplicity, I'm, we're not going to discuss in general the behavior of the network at the boundary points. In this case, I will have to discuss the behavior of the network at infinity. I won't, I won't discuss the details of this or of this in a way because uh, reflecting the network to this point, take your network to a reflection with respect to this point, this point is no more a boundary point. So you can deal with the point or the boundary in a way after this trick like they are the inside point of a, of a double network or reflection of the union of this with the, refle with the reflected network. So I will discuss what happens inside here. And I will forget several moments the behavior and in some estimates the contribution of the boundary point. I ask you to believe me that they are not relevant and more or less 
if you understand what's happening in the interior, you are able also to deal with what is happening at the boundary points. Moreover, there is, a, if you really don't want to deal too much with boundary points, you can also assume, like in the simulation, that you live on a torus. So that your network, for instance, is living on a flat torus. So there are no boundary points around. And you have kind of networks like that that they close. For there are also networks without boundary points in the plane. For instance, this guy, network without boundary points, free network, compact networks without boundary points, where all this theory can be, can be on the theory that I'm going to speak about can be applied. And moreover, all the theory can be uh, extended to motion of networks on a compact surface. Or, or on surfaces with even only complete that have a good behavior at infinity, or less. Bounded geometry, for instance. Okay, let me get back to my to the observation that I before. So here I put more or less the observation that I already told you, that the larger regions, more than six edges grows in the area, and less than six edges, the area decreases. With six, six, six edges, the area is constant in the flow. In a way, it means that the only region with less than, five, less than six edges can collapse. Before collapsing, one region must lose, with the other phenomenon that I mentioned, lose one or more of these edges, in order that the edges becomes less than, less than six. And uh, as I said, with the exception of uh, the times when there is a structural change, actually, apparently, all the flow is smooth. The curves are smooth, uh, and you see only triple junction around, and the concurring curves at every triple junction is only 120 degrees. Without vanishing of a region, that instead it uh, can produce several situations when you get a multipoint. If you have only one curve collapsing, well, there is only one situation. You get a four point. And actually, if uh, we look again at the, at, the, at the movie, what we find is that uh, there is always a situation like this. Four, a four point with angles, not general angles, but this is coming, this is a, actually it's one convergence here around. You have this angle of 120 because of this, and what you get here is a four, a, a four point with angles of 120, 120, 60, and 60. Not a general, always you, uh, you observe this kind. Of, and then immediately after there is an opening in the other direction. And notice that this angle of 60 here becomes in a way, an angle of 120. There is a discontinuity in the angles, which is not here. Here, the angles are continuous, in a way, and here there is a discontinuity in the angles. The angles of 60 becomes immediately an angle of 120. Here, there is a situation like where this guy here, which we call the theta, theta guy, evolves with a collapsing of this uh, in, uh, inner curve here. You get this guy, again, 120, 120, and 60, and then it opens like this uh, kind of eyeglasses guy. OK, on this observation, you look at several simulations. You see that they are always there. Then, apparently, it's very, in my opinion, quite complicated. And uh, you need a lot of technology from analysis and geometry to prove this uh, observation, actually, in practice. And let me say, I'll, I'll tell you in advance, we, need, uh, we still don't have a full proof. We, need, uh, we have an open conjecture that I will mention tomorrow. In order to, well, one main open conjecture and another secondary uh, conjecture that we believe, but at the moment we are not able to prove, in order to make rigorous this observation in the model 
of motion by curvature. Okay, since the networks, uh, we say that, okay, if uh, the observation here in particular is true, so this guy with only triple junction and 180 degrees are very important, are the basis of the, of the structure of the problem. And so we started investigating how they behave during, during the flow, and we call them regular. So regular is uh, a, reg a network such that every, <coughs> Every junction is a triple junction, and the angles are always 120 degrees, the regular ones. That uh, hopefully, at the end, should turn out that uh, with the exception of a uh, discrete set of times, uh, all the networks of the, where there is a change of structure, all the networks of the flow are done like this one, are regular, actually. To be more precise, we are considering embedded network so you cannot, the curves cannot intersect. They are really, in a way, interfaces between the regions, the inner regions. So you cannot consider crossing network. Moreover, for uh, several technical, well, they can only intersect at the end, the curves. And uh, on, the, on a point on the boundary, you can only have one curve right there, not another curve. This is more a technical assumption, but uh, it's uh, very good to have it. And uh, this is the concurrency condition, which is something some, sometimes called herring condition, that you only have a triple junction and uh, the angles between the three concurring curves, which are, which are C2 curves till the boundary, till the, till the end. They form angles 120 degrees, and this is, can be expressed analytically, saying that the sum of the inner unit normal to the free curves is equal to zero. This more or less, this is uh, equivalent to say that the free angles are 120 degrees. There is only the possibility that they have 120 degrees. Example, easy example. The one is the <coughs> the trio that I, that I depicted before. A trio is simply a regular, a regular triad, actually. Three, three, when I say regular curves, I think at least C2, but very often it's infinity curve, actually. Embedded, three embedded curves, they don't intersect, they have three fixed points on the boundary, and they meet at a single triple junction with 120 degrees. And this, is this other guy, another simple guy, which we call a spoon, which Bracke call it a spoon, actually, that it's uh, given by two curves, one curve connecting a single fixed point on the boundary and a curve which close to itself, and again, only one triple junction and 120 degrees there. So that's a regular spoon. Actually, if you want to see other example of these guys, more or less these are all the possible topologies we have this guy, theta, with no points on the boundary and uh, uh, eyeglasses in two different versions. And uh, this guy, with the, they are the only two with two points on the boundaries. Here, only two triple junctions around. That ones, these ones were the only guys with one triple junction around, the easiest. These, are, these guys are the only ones with at most two triple junctions around. So this island and this tree, because it's the only one which doesn't have any loop inside. What does it mean moving by curvature? You know, trying to put things analytically. Well, as I said, well, you have a, a regular network, so this collection of curves, parameterized in time, because you want this your flow in, uh, in R2, with the several uh, conditions that you have kind, kind by side, you need to have your tables where you know where the curve intersect, forming the structure of your network. But when they move, what you want is exactly that the time derivative of the curve, which means the velocity of the motion at every point, is in normal direction. So the normal velocity of your curve is equal to the curvature. K is the curvature of the curve gamma passing by that point. If you write the curvature by elementary differential geometry curves in the plane, your curvature is actually given by taking the second derivative 
divided by the square. This, this curve are not parameterized in arc length, are simply map giving your curve. You only want that they are regular, which means that the, ta the space derivative is different by zero. So you can divide here. So you take this guy here, the second derivative divided by the square of the first derivative, and project it on the normal component, which is exactly what I'm doing here. This new is the normal to the curve at the point x and t. So you take this guy, project it, and uh, this is the, the projection operator. You take this, and this is the law telling you that your, all your curves are moving at every point, also the boundary points, by curvature. So now you want to find a solution. <laughs> so you have an initial network, your initial set of curves with all their relation, and now you want to look uh, if there is an extension in time of this, uh, uh, of this uh, set of curves satisfying this equation. More precise, you want something which is actually C2 in space, in order to speak easily, uh, classically, of curvature, and C1 in time in order to write down this time derivative. And moreover, you still want that every time your curve are regular, so the x derivative is different by zero. This is, you want that your, like in the simulation, <coughs> the, con the herring condition, the fact that the they are only triple junction, and the angles between the free curves are 120 degrees, which is uh, analytically expressed by this equation here, still holds, still there in the evolution. And uh, finally, in a way, you can rewrite this, uh, any solution of this. Uh, this says that the normal component of the time derivative of gamma must be equal to the curvature, which means that the full derivative of gamma must be equal to the curvature times the normal plus some function times the normal. If you're able to find out uh, a gamma such that at time zero is equal to your initial network, and uh, at every, for some short time, for some time, at time positive, it satisfies this free condition, well, you say that you find your, finally, you find out actually a solution of this, so a motion by curvature of your initial network. For an initial regular network, because if you want something which is continuous up to the time zero, this condition must, must hold also at time zero. So we are now concentrating in find out the flow for a short time, for a moment at least, for an initial regular network. Only triple junction and error in condition of 120 degrees satisfied. For the other non-regular network, which means uh, multiple junction or triple junction with not the correct angles, we will deal later on. Okay, actually, when you, after you formulate this problem, The assumption that you have all this regularity till the boundary of your curves has immediately some consequences. Because actually, let me fix some notation. I will call tau the tangent to our curves, which means over gamma x, that they came right because this guy is different by zero, so the curves are regular and I will always consider the normal being a rotation of the tangent where r is the rotation of 90 degrees in the plane. Just to set up the notation. Okay, so immediately, suppose there's two curves, gamma i and gamma j, real corners, arrives at the same point O. And they flow by, and I have a solution of my flow by curvature. Well, suppose that this point for the curves gamma i and gamma j are exactly gamma i of zero t, and must be equal to gamma j of zero t. Since you don't want the two curves go different direction, this, this triple junction might stay there. Okay, so I have this. 
I can simply differentiate. So if I differentiate, this must hold for every time. So what you get here, if the last equation is satisfied, you must see that uh, at the triple junction, ki ni i plus lambda i tau i must be equal to kj ni j plus lambda j tau j. This for every couple of curves concurring at the triple junction. So there is also the third curve. So this is also must be equal to k, k, sorry. <laughs> Let's change this. That's gamma m. Km, now m, plus lambda m, tau. And this must hold along your flow. And now, <coughs> if you do some uh, linear algebra, knowing that these are 120, always, so the sum of the tangent and the sum of the normal also, sum added to zero, you do some linear algebra using this, what you find out that uh, you must have the sum of a k i, one, two, three. So let me write this in this. ki plus kj plus km equals to zero. And also, the tangential part of the velocities must add to zero. So you already have some kind of condition so on your, on your flow. And actually, you also find out, again, by linear algebra, a good way to see these things is to call, OK, now forget for a moment about i, j, and m. Let's call it gamma 1, 2, 3. This must hold for every triple junction. At every triple junction, this must happen. And call bk is equal to the vector ki1, k2, k3. And big lambda is equal to lambda1, lambda2, lambda3. And, uh, OK, can be seen. You can rewrite this to uh, equation like the big K vector product, the vector 1, 1, 1 equals to 0, which is also equal to uh, uh, big lambda 1, 1, 1 equals to 0. Oh, sorry are perpendicular to these guys. Perpendicular to these guys. And moreover, you can also do some other linear algebra that if you take the sum of lambda i, ki, this is equal to 0, which means, again, that uh, Big K is perpendicular to big lambda. So they form an orthonormal frame, but an orthogonal frame. And uh, to be more precise, you can also get out from this that K is equal to lambda wedge 1, 1, 1 over square root of 3 which also means, uh, by taking the, the modulus, that uh, the modulus of big K is equal to the modulus of big lambda, which actually says that uh, if you have a control on the free curvatures at the triple junction, which is the normal component of velo the velocity at the triple junction, you also have a control on the tangent velocity at the triple junction. 
So you can only, if you want to estimate on the tangent velocity, the tangent velocity there that apparently doesn't get in the equation trying to solve, so apparently you don't have too much control. This is partially true because at least at the triple junction, the partial velocity can, the, the tangent velocity cannot be whatever she wants. It's related by this equation to the normal velocity, which is related to the curvature at the triple junction. Okay, these are in a way, yes? Sorry, I don't hear. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The, the last one. On the junction. No, so this, this is everywhere. This one is everywhere. Also on the junction. This, this is another way to write down the condition over there. You have some. I'm sorry for the bad notation. Here, this is the set of the, well, the tau, tau i, it's the, the sum of the free tangent getting to the triple junction. That O, O is the triple junction. So that the free tangent must be zero, which means 120 degrees at every triple junction. And moreover, this is another way to rewrite the equation over there. I want that the time derivative of gamma, the normal part is equal to the curvature, then there is some other lambda tangential part that apparently I don't know at the moment. But at the triple junction cannot be whatever she wants because of this uh, linear algebra computation. Okay, then, so at the end we have, so I, I, I found out something taking the first condition, the structural condition that uh, gamma i, I use this, gamma i of zero t is equal to gamma j of zero t for concurring curves. Also have this, that the sum of tau i in zero t is equal to zero. So if I found out information, taking the time derivative of this equation, structural equation here, now we can find out other information taking the time derivative of this equation here. But to do that, I need to take the time derivative of the tangent vector. So I need some uh, computation. Uh, So I have to find out the evolution equation for the relevant quantities on the curves moving by curvature. So we start with this, that time derivative of gamma is equal to k times the normal plus this lambda tangent. And uh, let me put this. The S is the arc length along the curve. And the derivative in arc length is exactly the derivative in the parameterization divided by delta x of gamma. And there is, a, well, if uh, it's obvious by Schwarz theorem that if I can take the x and t derivative, I can switch them. But this instead, I consider the arc length derivative, I can no more switch them because the arc length derivative, the arc length is not 
independent of time. So I need the switching formula when I pass from t, when I invert t and s derivative, which is uh, useful in the following computation. And uh, the formula is this, let me write this, the time derivative as derivative is equal to the s derivative time derivative plus k square minus s derivative of lambda s derivative. You can get it, well, I will let you the survey that we almost finish with all the details of the computation, but this is uh, anyway a nice exercise to, for uh, elementary differential geometry. And uh, just let me show you an example how to use this in order to compute, for instance, the time derivative of a tangent vector during the evolution. Then you can find out all the other evolution equation for the relevant quantities. Let's try to compute what is time derivative of the tangent. Well, what is the tangent? Well, the tangent is simply the s derivative of a curve, since it is in half length. So this is equal to time derivative of s derivative of gamma. Now I want to switch using this. So this is equal to s derivative time derivative of gamma plus k squared minus lambda s of s derivative of gamma, which is actually the tangent. What is this? Well, I know this. It's given by the evolution equation. So this is equal to s derivative of the velocity of the motion, which is k times the normal plus lambda times the tangent plus this guy there, k square lambda s tau. So now you have to distribute this derivative here. The first gives you k s times the normal. Then I, I have plus k times the s derivative of the normal. Well, elementary differential geometry tells you that the s derivative of the tangent is equal to the curvature times the normal. What is the s derivative of the normal? Well, the normal is the rotation of the tangent. Rotation is invariant, independent of s, so this is, so it gets out. So this is equal to the rotation of the s derivative of the tangent, which is k times the normal. And uh, the normal is the rotation of the tangent of 90 degrees in uh, anti, um, uh, anti-clockwise. So if you take it two times, you simply put a minus in front of your vector. So it is equal to rotation of rotation. k is a constant, you can take it out, of uh, the tangent, which is simply minus curvature times the tangent. So here, the s derivative of the normal is minus k times the tangent. So minus k squared, the other k comes from here, tangent. Now I want to do the same here. I take s derivative of lambda plus lambda s tangent and s derivative of the tangent plus lambda, s derivative of a tangent is written here, it's k times the normal. And then I have to add this, but you see, which is not unexpected, because if you derive a unit tangent vector, what you find out is another tangent vector which is orthogonal. So there is a cancellation of the tangent pieces, one and two, that appear right here. And the conclusion is that what you get is ks 
plus lambda k times the normal. A little bit long, but uh, straightforward. So if now I use this here, I take this now, and I take the time derivative of this. So it still must be zero. When I take the time derivative, I now can use this that I just computed. And uh, what I've concluded is that uh, zero is equal to the sum of ksi plus lambda i ki. So to find out a new relation that must hold at every triple junction. So we have a zero level relation, no derivative, zero level. Tangent is one derivative. One level derivative, which actually we impose in our problem. And then what you follow is we had the second, what I wrote before, the sum of the k i must be zero. k is two S derivative of gamma. So we have a second level derivative, a second level condition. Third level condition, derivative of the curvature. So free derivative of your parametrization. And so on. Because if now I take this, that must hold every time at every triple junction, I take time derivative again. OK, now I have to compute what is the time derivative evolution, evolution of the curvature. But uh, I guess you can believe me that uh, what you find out is uh, KSS plus something. So you get another condition here of fourth order, and so on. Taking time derivative repeatedly, you find out a lot of conditions. These conditions are called complementary condition of your problem. And uh, we'll get on that in a moment. But just to because it's very important for the future. I'm not doing the computation. It's another very nice exercise along the same lines. If we, since the curvature is the most important object around here, the evolution of a curvature satisfies this. Time derivative of the curvature is equal to KSS uh, plus KS lambda plus K to the third power. This will be very important. And again, you do along the same lines, use the fact that the curvature is two space derivative in arc length of the parabolization. OK. So if you have a smooth flow, C infinity, which means that you can do all these derivatives. I didn't get into details if you can do or not. I simply took derivative. Suppose you have a infinity flow till the border, till the triple junction. You can take whatever deriv derivatives you want. You have, you have a lot of condition that must be satisfied at the triple junction for your flow. Infinity. For every order, you have one. OK, now, how to, this is a priori computation. Now, <coughs> I want to give some, uh, uh, hints how to find a solution to this problem. So at least uh, for regular, initial, regular networks, how to find out the short time existence of your flow. If you look at this problem here, actually it's a parabolic problem, quasi-linear, since there is this, great, this uh, first derivative around. But actually, if you take linearization and look at the symbols, because of the fact that you are killing one part of this operator here, you are taking this guy here and projecting only on the normal component, you will see some zeros in your symbols. So it's a degenerate, quasi-linear, parabolic system, actually, that actually doesn't fit directly in the standard theories. But the fact that you are, are really interested only in the normal component, but you have some freedom in choosing the tangential component and solve a problem 
with a special tangential component that you set as you want, and that if you're able to solve that, well, you are able to solve this, because the normal part is the same. So what is the right choice of tangential component? Well, I take all this, the wall operator, without the projection. Well, if you found the solution of this, well, simply project, and you get the solution of the, of the other ones, of the original, or the one that you are interested in. And uh, this one is no more degenerate. You are not throwing anything away. It fits, it's a quasi-linear, parabolic system, non-degenerate. But then you have to satisfy the condition at the triple junction. I'm forgetting to speak about the boundary points. Forget about that. You can also have to satisfy the condition there. There are similar conditions to this one at the boundary points, but forget about that for a, while, for a moment. Let's concentrate on the, all this family of condition coming. It's gone. No. Okay. All this con Okay, all these conditions that I wrote there that you can imagine you can obtain going on differentiating in time. So we call special curvature flows the ones that you can obtain solving this problem. Okay, it's not going. Solving that problem over there that produce one flow by curvature, like in the original problem. Why, when you are able to find out a solution of this. Okay, we did with Matteo Novaga at the very beginning for the easy situation. Because, uh, well, everything fits in a theory, in a theory of Salonikov. Quite uh, complicated ones. That uh, if the operator is non-degenerate, like I said before, and now all the, all the point is about the boundary condition, and the guy there is too compatible. What does it mean, too compatible? It means that the condition of order two coming, down, coming out by this computation is satisfied. Then you have a solution in the standard spaces of, uh, standard parabolic spaces of order spaces C2 plus alpha, 1 plus alpha, C2 plus alpha in space, 1 plus alpha, alpha in time. If the condition order two, that means that uh, if our initial guy there, that triad, this super easy situation, is made by C2 alpha, C2 plus alpha curves, joining at 120 degrees, and the sum of the free curvature there, well, this is equivalent, sorry. This is two comp the exact two compatibility is this one. Of, for the initial triad. Then you find out the solution, if it is too compatible. What is actually true is that uh, if you have this, sum of the free curvature equal to zero, then you can choose a special reparameterization of your initial triad such that this condition here is actually satisfied. So you have a very special class of triads that you are able to let evolve for short time in the class, this natural class, over there. In fact, it's easy to see that this condition implies that the sum of the free curvature must be zero. Instead, the vice versa is that if you have this, you need some kind, you, there is always some reparameterization putting you in the situation that uh, your sigma there the reparameterized sigma there satisfy the condition there. So what you do, you have this condition, this geometric condition, reparameterize in order that your triad become too compatible, let it evolve by means of this theorem, and then reparameterize back. Because being a geometric problem, it's invariant by reparameterization. If you reparameterize, let the triad evolve, and reparameterize back, you have the same curvature flow of the unreparameterized three of that. So you can always use it, since because it's a geometric, uh, it's a geometric problem. The curvature is invariant by reparameterization. 
not the tangential component, only the curvature. But uh, the tangential part of the velocity is not relevant here, because at the end we are looking for uh, a solution which satisfies that equation there that involves only the normal component. OK, then, it's not so difficult to generalize the result to a more general triad, a more general network. Again, too compatible. And actually, also, if you start with something which is smooth, and smooth means not only that all the curves are infinity, that all the conditions, which is infinity compatible, in a way, then you find out a smooth solution of your, of your flow up to time zero. This is all contained, fortunately, in something which was already there in the Solonikov theory, which is quite involved, actually. So we actually, we more or less used the theorem as a black box, uh, only checking that all the hypotheses were satisfied, in particular the compatibility condition, in order to use the theorem. So this was more or less the line. The very special case, the idea, come back to Bronsa de Reitich, uh, they did for a, uh, for a triad in, with some extra geometric assumption. We, in a way, take away the geometric assumption and uh, we did the general theorem for a general uh, network, a regular network. And uh, when you find out the special flow, as we said before, since uh, the special flow is different by the, the curvature flow only by the tangent part, you actually has produced a general flow like that, which is a solution of the initial problem. So actually, if you find a, a regular, two compatible initial network, uh, you have a curvature flow, actually. Not only a special. Special is a technique in, that, in order to get real a solution of the curvature flow. OK. What, is, what about uniqueness? Well, actually, you see that there are a lot of uh, choice here around. I, sh I choose the, the way to produce a solution. I reparameterize, uh, and then I get back. Uh, so you would like to have at least some kind of geometrically unique uh, curvature flow, which means uh, uniqueness up to reparameterization. So that uh, if you look at your network as a wall, you don't see the difference between the network and this reparameterization. If you look as maps, you see that they are different objects. But if you look as a set, you don't see the difference. So you want kind of a uniqueness looking at the set. Unfortunately, only in some special situation, and the point is that you have a geometrical uniqueness if you start with an F with C to alpha in this class. The natural class where you look for uniqueness is C2 in spaces one in time, as it is natural. We are able, and it's an open problem, to show unique geometric uniqueness only if you restrict the flow in, the, uh, in, um, in older spaces, in C2 plus alpha in space, in C1 plus alpha, half, uh, alpha, uh, alpha, uh, alpha over two in time but not in the natural space. And the problem is related to the lack of maximum principle. Because uh, since you have this boundary point, you cannot use uh, easily maximum principle. Because you can use maximum principle only when your maximum is an interior of your domain. So only in this case, if the maximum of the quantity you are interested in is an interior of the curves. If it is on the triple junction, you cannot use maximum principle. The maximum principle is the main tool in order to prove uniqueness for mean curvature flow in the smooth situation. Okay, just to conclude, by approximation, after having this uh, theorem for very special network, it's actually possible to let start an initial C2 regular network, only C2, without any compatibility condition, losing the continuity, actually, of the curvature function. Because uh, immediate, this theorem tells you that immediately the flow is smooth at every positive time. So 
So immediately the compatibility conditions are all satisfied. Immediately means for every positive time. So if in particular the one of order two, if the curvature is continuous, means that also must be satisfied at this condition here, must be satisfied also at time zero. But if you don't start with something which is too compatible, like you can do it because here it, you only ask your initial network to be C2, this cannot be true. So you lose continuity of the curvature, but still you have at least C1 convergence to the initial, to the initial network. Find out a, a curvature flow which is smooth for every positive time. Curvature flow which is regular and smooth for every positive time. Again, the geometric uniqueness is absolutely an open problem. But in general, as I said, you would like to have uniqueness in the natural space, and uh, it's impossible to. At the moment, uh, it's impossible because, well, apparently, there is only the line of maximum principle here cannot be used. OK, just a minute, sorry, I'm late. OK, all this work for regular guys. Super smooth, super satisfying, satisfying all the compatibility condition, or two compatibility condition, or simply C2. But only triple junction, only 120 degrees. But instead, you want something to let evolve any network. Even if you start with something at the very beginning regular, when there is a collapse, which is what we are going to investigate in the next lecture, well, you see, we, we had four points, or multi points. And you want to go on, to move on after the collapse, like in the simulation. So even if you avoid it at the very beginning, you have really to deal with the general networks, with general structure, not only regular. For instance, you have this, you, have, you want to restart. So fortunately, there was a quite weak uh, uh, definition of, uh, of, uh, of curvature flow, which is, was the, this theorem was the problem that Ilman and Neves and Schulz, uh, that we were able to prove that there is a bracket flow, which is a kind of uh, variational geometric measure theory uh, notion of flow by curvature, which is very special, which gives you an evolution of your network, which is very special bracket flow. In particular, it is smooth, all the compatibility, all curvature infinity, regular, 120 degrees, and only triple junction around for every positive time which is exactly what we see in the simulation. So the beginning, the first, your network, initial network, can be very messy, having a lot of uh, multiple junction or bad angles, but this theorem tells you that, uh, okay, it's a quite uh, weak definition, which is anyway immediately super regular for every positive time. So you can restart your flow starting from things like that, from, with a four point, for instance, and having a curvature flow. Okay, next uh, lecture will be devoted to understanding this part, the collapse part that we saw in the simulation, and trying to describe more accurately as possible what's happening when one curve collapses or one region collapses, with the idea that with this theorem you can move on. We want to say that actually every collapse carry us in the, in the hypothesis of this theorem. So it can be applied to continue the flow after, uh, after the singularity. Okay, I'll stop here today.